So, I just want to look at those first few lyrics. I can almost see it, that dream I'm dreaming, but there's a voice inside my head saying you'll never reach it. Have you ever been there? You ever had that voice inside your head telling you that's not going to happen? You're not going to be able to do that, that, that thing. That, now, that, that is not the quantum field. <laughs> that is your reactive mind. That is all the core beliefs that you've built up up to this point. It's all the stuff you have fallen prey to in life. Everybody else's opinions. That's when that voice comes in and says, you're not going to be able to do that. Or false evidence appearing real, the fear that you've created over the lifetime of, of things that really did happen that have taught you something, but it's still not the quantum field of pure creativity saying you can do anything. So that's what that first thing is about. And she says... Because Miley Cyrus wrote these lyrics, but I gotta keep trying, because it ain't about how fast I get there, and it ain't about what's waiting on the other side. It's the climb. We, I think, sometimes believe that there is a destination for us to get to, and there isn't. There's just the climb. That's it. All there is is the constant movement of life, the evolution of life, your life, right? Your life, Kelly. That's what's happening constantly. And it's not about getting to that final moment. You know, that's, that's the old religion teaching us, get to that final moment, repent, and we'll take you to heaven. No, that's not how it works. How it works is life is infinite and eternal, and you get to live infinitely and eternally. But right now you're in this body, living this experience. And it's not about getting to the end of it. Look at Nancy. She's like, I want to be vitally alive till the last possible moment, right? You're going to slide into home plate used up. <laughs> That's what you want, right? Yes. That's what I want. But I don't want to be used up till that last second. <laughs> up to that point, I may still be 100% vital. And then, boom, okay, next. Whatever comes next. So this song is a special song to me because... In 2010, uh, I chose this song to be the theme song of the Religious Science International, the RSI conference in Chicago. And the RSI conference, well, now it's CSL. The CSL conference was just this past week. So I picked this song. I was, I was the producer of that particular conference that year. And I picked this song, The Climb. And it was interesting because a lot of people said, it's interesting, why, why that song? Because it kind of says we have to go through things. I'm like, and we do. And yeah, but it's saying that there's no, nothing on the other side. I was like, is there? Is that what we're really teaching? We're not going there. So it was, I picked this song for a very good reason. But I also picked this song because in 2010, when the conference happened in August, I had just spent six months battling cancer. And August was my, I finished chemo and radiation in July. And I knew I had to be in Chicago for August. And I was 138 pounds of skeleton flying to Chicago to do that conference. And I was the final speaker of the week. So I think I gained a couple pounds during the week at least. Um, but when I got up to speak that final night, what I wanted to do that night was get up and prove the teaching. Prove mind over matter that I had just spent the last six months going through hell and coming out the other side. And I also wanted to talk about the fact that those six months weren't, to me, something that I had to get through. It was something that brought me to something, really brought me to an awareness, an opening. Um, so our theme this month is vitality. And I wanted to get up on that stage, that closing night of the, of the uh, event, and claim my vitality in front of everyone. And I know Steve was there, and Diane was there. Um, most of the people that were in religious science at the time were there. So my question is, where am I 14 years later? Where have I gone in 14 years with this teaching? That week... I wanted to use the climb to show that there's always going to be another uphill battle, always going to be something to, to, to move through. There's a, because if you're alive, if you're living, then things are going to show up. 
And we are not the teaching of the ostrich feathers. We are not a teaching where we stick our head in the sand and say, it's all good, it's all God, I want to see nothing but that. No, what we've really grown into, where am I 14 years later? Understanding that I can see God in everything, even though we used to sing it all the time. But God needs to be seen everywhere in everything. And no religious organization can co-opt what God is or who God is. And I also think we need to stop being afraid of the word God and start turning it into a four-letter word when it's not. It's a three-letter word. It is really time for us to take God back and understand what God is. God is right here. God is right there. God is in Ukraine. God is in the Gaza Strip. God is everywhere. And if we start realizing that, maybe we'll stop having Ukraine and Gaza Strip experiences. And it's up to us to start there. You know, I, I called um, a church this week. Um, I called a church this week for a specific reason, but I, I spoke to the minister. I said, you know, I'm just having a little bit of trouble with what's coming to me from, from your church. Some things have been happening coming to our church from this other church. And I said, we're an, we're an inclusive church. And this minister said, we are an inclusive church. And he said, we are an inclusive Christian church. I said, we are an inclusive church that also includes Christianity. I said, but your church has told me that the only way I can come to your church and be gay is if I renounce it or don't, don't do anything that would, would show that I was gay. And this minister said, well, that's correct because it's an abomination. And I said, how can you call yourself an all-inclusive church and then tell me that, that the LGBTQ community isn't allowed to be there? And he said, well, because we really don't even consider the LGBTQ community a thing. He said, we see your true self, your God self. And I have to tell you, I even feel it now. My head was going to explode off my shoulders. And I was like, James, James, love only. <laughs> love only. Forgive everything. And remember who they are. <laughs> remember who you are. So... So for me, I just, I did. I got, off, I got off the phone call in a very loving way. I said, well, we'll have to agree to disagree, but I will tell you this. I think you need to re-look at your website because it says inclusive and all are welcome. If you're going to say we're not welcome, just tell us we're not welcome. Just at least be honest. Be honest about it. That's one thing I can say about the new pope. He's honest. He says you are all welcome, and he means it. He really means it, and he doesn't get involved in all the other crap, right? So, huh. yeah. so it's been a, quite a week, and I knew I was giving this talk today about where am I 14 years later, and I have to say, one of the places I am 14 years later, and I have to give this up to um, Reverend Rita, because she said the same thing to me this week. I said, you know, it's time for us to, to find our voice. You know, if other organizations are able to be so clear about who I should be in my life and what is and is not permissible to them, we should be even clearer that we are all inclusive, that we accept everyone, we judge no one, and we need to get out there and teach this. And, and, and that's going to change the world. That will change the world. So the title of my talk today is Always Up. Now, obviously the, the song was The Climb, so I wanted to do Always Up, but there were two, two, two positions here. Um, one is we should always be upbeat, and that's not my point today, because I don't think anymore that we should always be up. We should always be up. Don't those people annoy you? Yes. I mean, think about that, because I was one of those annoying people. I used to, thank you, Eric. <laughs> You've seen me not up, but, but, but it's true. I was always like, no, we should always be happy. We should always be cheerful. We should always put our, our best foot forward, we should, I, which we still should do. We should always be, and then I suddenly went, wait a minute. I don't feel like being up right now because I'm not necessarily up right now. 
but I can still know who I am while I'm not up. So that's one part of what the talk could have been about, always up. The second one, oh, Ernest Holmes said this, don't become what you experience. Always hold to the truth of who you are. Just think about that for a second. Don't become what you experience. You're going to experience a lot. And one of our issues is that we tend to become what we experience. This happens in our life, and we become that energy. We become that thing. But here's the thing. You get to experience whatever's going on in your life from the perspective of knowing who you are. Okay, this does not, what Dr. Bitzer used to say, never step off of principle, even on special occasions. How many of you have some special occasions going on right now? Right? Stay on principle. That occasion will shift, will change. Tara Brock says this. Don't be afraid to experience what is yours to experience. Experiences never touch the truth of who you are. So here's the thing. I don't have to always be upbeat. If I'm experiencing something, I'm going to feel what I feel, experience what I feel, and know it's not touching who I am. And always remember who I am in the midst of it all, no matter what. Like that conversation. As, as I said, I did feel my head like, I won't say literally explode, because Eric Bork's not here today. But um, I, I did feel my head like getting bigger. I mean, I could feel the temples. You ever feel that when, when your temples are going? You're like, OK, clearly I'm a, my blood pressure just shot up. But then I took, I, it, while we were talking, I was like, what are you fighting for, James? Are you fighting to change somebody's mind? Or are you willing to let them have it the way they want it? And that's where I landed. I was like, it's OK. You get to be that way. And you know what really was really working inside of me? That was my initiating factor. <laughs> that was the thing that spurred me on to think, I need to speak more. I, as if I could speak more. I need to get my message out there. We, the ministers of this center, we need to be out there telling people that they are OK exactly the way they are. Don't let anyone tell you that who you are is wrong. So that's our job, right? So. The second version of always up is the idea of keeping your consciousness up to the standards of who you are. Walking around, constantly keeping your, your thoughts where they need to be. And there's this great quote which I gave to the ministerial class. We're doing these stand and delivers now, teaching moments, where one of them becomes a teacher and one of them becomes the student. I read a quote, and the student says what it means, and the teacher has to talk to the student as though he were in charge or she were in charge. It's really fascinating. Here's the quote. We should take the highest thought we have and attempt to enlarge on this consciousness until it embraces a more vital concept of reality. Meaning, you should take the highest thought you can possibly get to, the highest thought you could get to, and go from there in every situation. So that was my other understanding of always up. And that was going to be my talk. Those two things. In every situation, seek the highest thought possible and climb from there. Start with the highest thought you can get and then go from there. Which means, by the way, you're probably not being reactive. You are being creative. OK? So that was what I wanted to talk about today. And then this happened. So I woke up at 5.30 in the morning. And I, I, had, I had been dreaming. And I had a dream that I was pregnant. <laughs> Literally, I was pregnant. I think I was like four months pregnant, maybe. I don't know. I really wouldn't, couldn't tell you. But I looked big. I was pregnant. And I woke up. I'm pregnant. And I had to pee. So I went to the bathroom to pee. And my head, I'm thinking, well, of course I have to pee. I'm pregnant. <laughs> pregnant people pee. <laughs> And so I peed. And then I started to walk back, and I caught my glimpse, glimpse of me in the mirror, and I was like, oh, I'm not pregnant. It took me that long to wake up, right? And I'm standing now in the mirror. You don't know any of this, because I did not share this. I thought, this is not sharing material. I thought, I'm not telling Kevin. It's so silly to talk about. And then I thought, I'll tell you instead. <laughs> so 
So now I'm in a mirror going, I'm not pregnant. And can I tell you what I felt? I was like so sad. I was like, aw, that would have been so much fun. And I can hear all the women now saying, uh-huh, yeah. How many men here have dreamt about being pregnant? <laughs> a lot of people online are raising their hands. Um, so none of you men have ever dreamt about being pregnant? You've never been pregnant in a dream? <laughs> Just me. <laughs> I am so special. Really, true. Um, how many women have dreamt that they'd like the men to carry those babies? Yeah, okay, good. That, that's better. So, um, so I, when I, now I'm up, now it's 6.30, and I'm like, I got to write my talk. I mean, I know what I'm going to talk about, but, and I'm writing it, I'm putting my notes down. I started a PowerPoint, and I was like, I don't want to do a PowerPoint today. I want everybody looking at me. <laughs> so I'm just like, no PowerPoint. And then I went on Google, and I said, what does it mean when a man has a dream about having, uh, being pregnant? You'd be surprised how many men have had that dream. So there are five possibilities for what's going on with you if you are a man and you're suddenly pregnant. Number one, there are new beginnings in your future and creativity. It's about the seed of a new project taking root. Isn't that exciting? Yeah. And I don't even have to go through childbirth. <laughs> Number two, anxiety and responsibility over starting a new chapter in your life. Now, I have to tell you, while there are many new chapters that I'm contemplating in my life, the conversation with that minister brought me to a new chapter in my ministerial life. It truly did. I had a, a, a visceral, a, 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 a primal reaction to when I hung up that phone. I was like, things are going to change around here. So, and yet, then I dreamt I was pregnant. <laughs> So clearly, there's some anxiety about this. Number three is personal growth, a metaphor for personal growth, the inner transformation of a journey of self-improvement, which shocks me that you've never been pregnant in a dream because you have so much self-improvement things going on in your life. Um, and I was like, that works, personal growth. OK, I'm good with that. Right, OK. Four, anticipation and change. You are on the cusp of something significant and your subconscious mind is processing this change. How's that sound? Aren't you all waiting to go home and dream about being pregnant now? <laughs> but this, these are only if, man, if, if you're a man being pregnant. Although probably females too. And then the fifth one, no, this must be for, fem, fi, for, for women too. Because the fifth one is, you really are pregnant. <laughs> so I got rid of number five. <laughs> um, so then I looked up the meaning of pregnant, which means full of meaning, significant, or suggestive. So it's about meaning. And then I had to make sense out of it all. I'm like, why am I dreaming about being pregnant? Now, I've always had an idea that it would be fun, it would be real amazing to have a, child, to have a baby, to be, to be that part of having a baby, to... Um, to, to, to have a baby. I've always felt that way. Since I was a little boy, I always wanted to be a father. I mean, I, I wanted, right since I met Kevin, I mean, that would be like, if I was dating somebody, male or female, the first thing I would say is, do you want to have children? You know, that's hard over a first date. <laughs> no, it's like, hi, it's so nice to meet you. Do you want to have children? <laughs> but that I knew I couldn't be with someone who did not want to have children because I was going to be a father. So I know that that's something that's in me anyway. But going all Jungian on this and figuring out why subconsciously this may be coming up right now was fascinating. But it actually brought me to my talk title, Always Up, because I got what was really going on. So we teach something called the creative process. You all know that, right? Creative process is what you think into the law comes out as form. It's that simple. Your mind is a creative mind, and the law of cause and effect is always asking you, what do you want? What do you really want? And what you are equal to in mind, you will get. And if you're not getting what you think you're equal to, then you have a lot of mixed messages going on in there. You're confusing the law. Actually, you're not confusing the law. The law is just saying yes. 
So you're going to give it a bunch of mixed messages, it's going to give you a bunch of mixed life, right? So that's called the creative process. But in the quantum field, it's called downward causation. Downward causation, meaning from conscious mind through the law into form. Downward causation, causing your life based on the way you use your mind. But you know what else there is? Upward causation. Do you all know what that is? Upward causation is when you do what we just did within the silence, when you get out of the way and let the universe move through you. Let the intelligence move through you. Let the creativity of the infinite move through you. Upward causation is that part of you that is bringing forth what you are contemplating from a gigantic and enormous field of possibilities, pure potential, pure possibilities, upward causation. So this is actually what my talk's about today, what I want us to leave here with, this understanding that if we were to get quiet enough, to stop the arguments, stop the fighting, stop trying to change people, stop them versus us, and just drop into that upward causation. Listen, the universe knows what it's doing. God knows what it's doing. It is always expanding us in our highest and best way possible. But we have to be willing to listen. We have to be willing to step aside from all the junk, step aside from your critical thinking minds, and be willing to listen. The second question in the five questions is, what wants to know me? The whole point of the five questions is that there is a field of intelligence that is ready to know you as soon as you're willing to know it to stop basing so much on this world out here and to start stepping into an infinite field of pure possibility. Well, my God, that field of pure possibility could even cause peace between Israel and the Palestinians, right? That's, that's a possible possibility. No matter what we're looking at, no matter what certain people will say, it doesn't matter. It's there because it's a possibility. It's pure potential, and it's moving through us. And I would say probably most people on earth want peace, want love only, because most people don't run countries. They just live in them. And most people who live in countries want peace. They want to be happy. They want their children to be happy. They want food on their table. They want them, or their children to go to school. That's what most people want. So it's time for us to really get out there and teach this. Get out there and let people know there is this thing called upward causation. Don't use those words because it's a little crazy to say that. But there is this thing in you that knows. Knows who it is, what it is, and knows how to bring all of this love out there. And if we can just be that type of a conduit and always be in that state of allowing whatever wants to come through us to come through us from the divine, we will live very different lives. Every morning on CPR, I start with the question, what do you really want? What do you really want? And I've had many answers over these days. And yesterday, when I asked the question, what do you really want? What came to me was peace. And I made a joke about it. I said, I'm, I hate to tell you what my answer is because I sound like Miss America, but world peace is what I really want. Because I was at the kitchen table counter and I was cooking and I realized that I had been impacted by what's going on in the world and that I was sad and that I couldn't look at one more picture of one more child, of one more body being carried out, I was like, I understand. I really understand this. I understand why people are so moved by what's going on, and sometimes moved in a, in a, in a destructive way for themselves. 
And so I said to myself, you know what? Good for you to actually notice, to actually really notice that you are being affected by this. Good for you to not be in that, it's all good, it's all God, it's all going to resolve itself perfectly. Because I do believe life is unfolding perfectly, but I also believe I am part of unfolding it. Every single one of us is part of unfolding it. So if we want to really unfold perfectly, then we have to start believing what we believe and not being afraid to speak it out loud to everyone. Because there's something that is upwardly moving through each one of us, and I know y'all can feel it, that is saying, it's time. Friday night, sitting right here, watching you know 20 some odd people all laying there, some of them crying because of the vibrations going on. I was like, what if we just did a world sound bath? Oh. Just everybody just has to lay down and freaking listen, <laughs> right? Get Netanyahu on a floor and put some bowls around him <laughs> and let him feel the vibrations before he makes another decision. That's really where I'm at. And while that may sound hard to, to accomplish, I'm willing to try. Are you? Are you willing to take this to the next level? Because there's something in this upward causation that is asking us to do that. Before we do anything else, listen. What wants to know you? I'll leave you with that question. Namaste. Thank you.